When Final Fantasy VII released in 1997, it challenged everything people thought they knew about gaming. Within the years that preceded its release, it challenged the creators too. This project pushed them to craft something many of them wouldn't have thought possible, but as development progressed, they learned to adapt quickly to using new technologies, to using new methods of storytelling, and to seeing the team increase from the typical size of 20 to 30 people to having one of the largest video game development teams ever assembled during that era. At its peak, there were up to 150 people working on Final Fantasy VII, and they were split between Japan, Hawaii, and Los Angeles, where they leveraged the location to pull in staff from Hollywood who had worked on movies like Jurassic Park and Stargate. Making sure this all melded together was a monumental task, but Yoshinori Kitase thrived, and leading from the front alongside Hironobu Sakaguchi, he managed to deliver what many consider to be one of the greatest games of all time. Nonetheless, such was the scale of the project, it featured unprecedented levels of depth, and due to the tight turnaround time, there were also numerous changes made throughout development. And it means that even now, there are still plenty of details relating to the creation of Final Fantasy VII and what's housed within the final product that may have been overlooked or just flat out missed. And that's what we're going to be running through today, with the hope that the obscure facts that we've selected are insightful on multiple levels beyond just being a headline. As that's important to us, because we always want to be going beyond, providing new perspectives on the wider story. That's why we won't be talking in detail about pretty common facts like Final Fantasy VII starting out as a PlayStation 2 game, that Uematsu composed One Wing Angel using the puzzle piece method, or that Sephiroth and Aerith were at one point planned to be siblings. What we're going to start off with instead is the lesser known fact that the Yuffie Kisaragi we saw within the final game was very different from how she had been envisioned earlier on in the game's development and that the way you were meant to obtain her ended up being completely repurposed. But before we do, here's a message from the sponsor of today's video, Raycon. Raycon sent us a pair of their everyday E25 earbuds not too long ago, and they arrived at the perfect time, as Lauren and I have just started getting back into running. As we geared up, what was surprising is that even though they're around half the price of other premium earbuds, the powerful bass was very noticeable, and it was great for getting into the groove when trying to push down our PBs. If you order a pair now, Raycon are offering 15% off if you use our link, buyraycon.com forward slash ffunion, which is in the description below. The everyday E25 earbuds come with everything you'd expect from a pair of premium earbuds, the latest model has around 6 hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, and there's even a stylish case that helps to keep them secure while charging them at the same time. So head over to buyraycon.com forward slash FFUnion if you're interested. It's pretty common knowledge that as Final Fantasy VII entered into its final stages of development, there were those amongst the crew who felt it would be prudent for them to cut Vincent Valentine and Yuffie Kisaragi as playable characters as they just didn't have enough time to implement them in a meaningful way while still hitting the strict deadlines they'd been given by their superiors. It was only after certain staff members protested that they were able to come to the compromise of having them both appear as optional characters. This meant they wouldn't be seen within any of the game's glorious FMV sequences, and players could miss out on acquiring them entirely. But should they be found, then they would still be able to have an impact on the game's wider lore. This decision was quite pleasing to some, and Yun Akiyama, one of the event planners on Final Fantasy VII, took full advantage. He had a strong affinity with Yuffie, and so, on top of working on material for the core plot, he worked himself to the bone to make sure that Yuffie would be a meaningful addition. This passion resonated with other members of the team like Kazushiga Nojima and Takashi Tokita, and together this saw them craft an interesting side story for Yuffie that would see her become a spunky 16-year-old thief from Wutai who had an obsession with Materia and real issues with her dad. This side story made Yuffie a very memorable character, but what's interesting is that prior to their decision, Yuffie and her planned story arc were almost unrecognisable from what ended up making it into the final product. As was revealed within the Final Fantasy VII Ultimania Omega, within earlier drafts of the narrative, 
Yuffie was planned to be 9 years older, and at one point her attire was meant to be red as opposed to green. Within this draft, her feisty nature was still present, but instead of being a materia thief, she was instead an ex-soldier who had become a bounty hunter, and she was hunting Cloud Strife and Sephiroth. The method of acquiring Yuffie was also quite different, and it related to posters that were placed all around the world. Each poster would feature Yuffie with a different appearance, and they would also display different stats. This was designed so that you could choose which version of Yuffie you wanted to have in your party by looking at that specific poster before you acquired her. It would have been a very cool and unique mechanic, but it was cut from the game and instead replaced by the quiz that was preceded by a random encounter, and this could be initiated by walking through forests after leaving the Mithril Mine, with each forest having a different encounter rate. What's interesting though is that the posters did remain, their purpose was just changed. Instead of relating to Yuffie in a direct capacity, they were instead used for the Turtles Paradise side quest. This saw the player tasked with finding flyers that had been placed all around the world to try and promote a bar in Wutai, and there were six in total, with the final poster being found in Yuffie's secret hideout. The location of the first poster was in Sector 7 of the Midgar slums, but in earlier drafts it was meant to be in the town of Elm, which was later renamed to Calm, and that brings us onto an interesting nuance within the narrative related to Calm that showed just how much ended up being cut from the original script, only to be stored up and used for the compilation that started releasing in earnest seven years after Final Fantasy VII had acted as a trailblazer on the PlayStation. Many people are well aware of the Nibelheim incident. It served as a prominent plot point during numerous sequences, and it was made all the more sinister by nobody in the town remembering who Cloud and Tifa were upon their return. What's not so well known is that there was also a Calm incident, and this was touched upon within the original game before being expanded upon in a significant manner in Before Crisis via a flashback. Within the context of the narrative, the Calm incident happened five years before the Nibelheim incident, and it happened when Veld, the then leader of the Turks, ordered a firebomb strike on what he thought was the location of individuals who had been leaking vital information out of Shinra. But when he gave the order, there was static, and Calm was bombed by accident instead of the actual location, which was 50 kilometers north of Calm. With the town a charred mess, Shinra decided the best thing to do would be to undergo an elaborate cover-up so that nobody would find out the truth. Any survivors were shipped off to Nibelheim for experimentation under the supervision of Professor Hojo, and Shinra would replicate the entire town, hiring actors and moving Shinra employees there to take the place of the villagers who had disappeared. Such was the heinous nature of this deed that many of the younger members of the Turks, such as Sung, Reno, and Rude, refused to be part of it, leaving Veld to handle the burden alone, even though he believed his family had died during the incident. And this helps to explain why, when you visit Calm in Final Fantasy VII, almost everyone in the village is abnormally positive about Shinra, as they are all secretly working for the company in an elaborate ruse that was attempting to cover up the truth. Now, as we discovered within our recent video about the evolution of battle systems, Final Fantasy VII built upon many of the concepts that had previously been introduced within Final Fantasy IV through VI. It did this by adding a ton of complexity under the hood, and one of the more interesting elements related to the flow of time. Within Final Fantasy VII's ATB system, there are four different methods that are used in the game to help determine how time flows, and these are the Global Timer, the Variable Timer, or V Timer, the Constant Timer, or C Timer, and the Turn Timer. Each of these has a specific function, and they are affected by different variables. For example, the Global Timer is affected by the Battle Speed option in the Config menu, whereas the V Timer is affected by a character's speed value. These timers are used to determine numerous things, such as how much each character's gauge is filled at the start of a fight, how quickly their gauge fills once a fight is underway, and how long status effects last. And if we focus a bit more on status effects, what's interesting is that the duration of them is often tied to one of those four specific timers. For example, stop will last for 30 units of global time, whereas sleep will last for 100 units of V time. 
When these timers are then combined, they layered on top of each other to translate into a literal number of turns that would have passed before the status effect should wear off, and this could have a lot of variety. For example, Death Sentence, which lasts for 60 units of C time, would last for 30 turns at maximum battle speed, 10 turns at the default battle speed, and 6 turns at the minimum battle speed. Meaning everything stays pretty relative in real terms no matter what battle speed you choose, but the difference in speed comes with how many decisions you have to make within a designated space of time, which makes it seem like that status effect wears off much faster than it actually does, which is pretty smart. To further the notion of gameplay in Final Fantasy VII being quite complex under the hood, it also featured more types of elemental attack than any other game in the franchise, even the MMOs. Within a typical Final Fantasy experience, you might expect to find 5 to 10 different types of elemental attack. These would include fire, ice and lightning, and some more interesting outliers that have been introduced as the franchise has developed, such as time and poison. Final Fantasy VII had 16 different types of elemental attack, and only 9 of them were displayed in a transparent manner. These 9 were fire, ice, lightning, earth, poison, gravity, water, wind, and holy. But there were 7 that were much less visible, and many of these elemental attacks were also exclusive to Final Fantasy VII. Cut, for example, was an elemental attack associated with physical attacks that would cut the enemy. Outside of being associated with Cloud's weapons, there were numerous enemies who could inflict cut damage, such as the Aero Combatant, but there were very few ways to negate its effect outside of equipping the Zedric armor or using the Dragon Force enemy skill. And it was much the same for other elemental attacks like Hit, which applied to blunt force attacks, Punch, which applied to piercing or thrusting attacks, and Shout, which was applied to attacks that made sound or noise, such as Ruby Weapon's Ruby Ray. In addition, Final Fantasy VII also featured Shoot, which had previously appeared in Final Fantasy IV, and another element called Restorative, which had previously appeared in Final Fantasy III, but unlike the others, the effect of Restorative could only be reduced by using M Barrier as opposed to being resisted. There was also a 16th elemental attack that was never referred to by a specific name in the game, but has since been denoted as the Hidden Element or the 10th Element. Within the Japanese version of the game, the Hidden Element was applied to attacks that were not associated with any of the other 15 elements, but this association was removed for the international version, and almost all of the Hidden Elemental attacks had other elements applied instead. The notable exceptions though were Ultima Weapon's Ultima Beam and Aeris Limit Breaks which still have the hidden element associated to them in the international version. The North American release also brought about many other changes, but one of the most interesting related to how the game was marketed to potential consumers. Up until Final Fantasy VII, Square had enjoyed a very close relationship with Nintendo, but following their decision to develop instead for the PlayStation, it led to a lot of bad blood. And following in the footsteps of the war that had ensued between Nintendo and Sega in years prior, when it came to marketing Final Fantasy VII, Sony went for the jugular. In addition to a whole host of merchandising and TV advertisements that appeared during SNL and The Simpsons, Sony went live with four print campaigns that would be published in the month of Final Fantasy VII's North American release and the two months that followed. These would be two-page spreads designed to excite gamers and they featured ridiculous statements about Final Fantasy VII, such as, it's to a human what headlights are to a deer, and you can actually hear your pupils dilate. But the most brutal was a campaign that took a massive dig at Nintendo. It said, someone please get the guys who make cartridge games a cigar and a blindfold, before having the following bylines in small print, Possibly the greatest game ever made is available only on PlayStation. Good thing, if it were available on cartridge, it'd retail for around $1,200. This last point was a reference to cartridges only having a tenth of the storage capacity of CDs, which was one of the main reasons Square had decided to jump ship in the first place, as Nintendo couldn't deliver the hardware they needed. As an interesting aside here, when Final Fantasy VII was being developed for the PC, Square USA used print advertising again, this time to try and recruit programmers who could help deliver the project. 
and they tried to appeal to said would-be programmers in an incredibly stereotypical way by using Tifa and stroking their ego. The ad in question led by saying, you want a piece of me, program boy? Go ahead, hit me with your best shot. It then finished up by saying that Square were working on games that made mere mortals weak in the knees. The other ad they used was a bit less aggressive, asking people to take part in a career day at Midgar where they were looking for golden programmers to create phenomenal games. Final Fantasy VII was of course a phenomenal game in its own right, with huge sales and accolades from the media and fans, but Final Fantasy VI, which was also directed by Yoshinori Kitase and produced by Hironobu Sakaguchi, was a huge success for the company in its own right when it launched on the SNES in 1994. It made sense then that the developers would want to try and sneak in some allusions to what had come before. It saw the model of Kate Sith resemble the Kate Sith Esper, and Typhoon made an appearance as a summon as opposed to being a supporting boss. But one of the more obscure allusions could be seen within Midgar's Sector 8 when the party returned toward the latter part of the game. After defeating Proud Clod, you would start your ascent to the top of the sister ray in order to try and stop Hojo, but just before, you would walk past a poster that could easily be missed that advertised a bar called Mount Colts, and this was a reference to one of the dungeons that appeared in the World of Balance in Final Fantasy VI. As a fun aside here, inside Mr. Hangman's item shop, which could be found within the Ghost Square at the Gold Saucer, there was another illusion. If you interacted with the jack-o'-lantern that resided within a cage, you'd be greeted with a muffled sound effect that was eerily similar to that of Kefka Palazzo, the main antagonist from the previous game. Kefka, of course, became synonymous as a villain because he was able to succeed with his plans, and to achieve these goals, his hands were covered in blood. In truth though, death had played a prominent part in the majority of Final Fantasy experiences, with NPCs perishing due to the actions of the game's aggressors and characters sacrificing themselves for the greater good. But with Final Fantasy VII, the developers wanted there to be a marked twist on how death was perceived. This led to them deciding that Aerith should die and that it shouldn't happen in a manner that was akin to what had been prevalent in Hollywood. Their decision shocked the gaming world, but what's interesting is that Yoshinori Kitase felt that Aerith's death wasn't enough. Instead, he had envisioned a grand finale to the game that would see many of the other playable characters die as well. Along with Kazushiga Nojima, who was the scenario writer for Final Fantasy VII, Kitase formulated an idea whereby the player would pick three characters that they would want to carry through until the end of the game, and as a consequence of their decision, the characters who had not been selected would perish when they parachuted into Midgar, which would have signified the start of their final journey. This was revealed during Polygon's extensive piece of editorial called Final Fantasy VII An Oral History, which saw them interviewing countless individuals who were involved with the creation of the game. And it was within this piece that Tetsuya Nomura, who was one of the driving forces behind the narrative, asserted that he was one of the main opposers to this idea and was behind it eventually being scrapped. Had he not done so, Final Fantasy VII would have had a very different and much more brutal conclusion. But with that final nugget, I think we're done. They were seven obscure facts about Final Fantasy VII that we feel you probably didn't know, and as always, we threw in a load of little bonus facts for good measure. Nonetheless, we're still sure there are some amongst you who knew all of them. Let us know in the comments below which one you found to be most interesting, and of course, if you enjoyed the video, please hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. A big thanks to all our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, and of course, a big thanks to all of you for watching this video. I hope to see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.